President. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning everyone. Dear colleagues, we'll start this commemoration for the Day of Memory. We'd like to start with a video and with some speakers after that, which will follow both with the colleagues present in the room as well as with all of those who are connected remotely. C'était ça notre hantise, rentrer ou raconter. Mais non pas dans un désir de vengeance. Je crois que personne ne doit se tromper sur les sentiments de ceux qui pourtant n'avaient plus à peine de voix pour parler. C'était uniquement pour qu'on évite que ça se reproduise. On a eu l'impression qu'on rentrait en enfer. Il y avait de la fumée partout, il y avait des odeurs nauséabondes. Euh, on voyait des cadavres le long de l'année centrale. Enfin, c'était quelque chose. On voyait les chiens qui, qui couraient dans, dans tous les sens, euh, à sauter sur des personnes qui avaient l'air de véritables squelettes en bureau. It just it breaks my heart, you know, especially when I see like a young baby here, and I know that was put in a gas chamber. You know, being a father and grandfather, you know, I, ju I just cannot cope with it. person who really felt like this in our age, I see some pictures in my mind, so... dovere accettare questo invito e avere questa occasione per ricordare il male altrui ma anche per ricordare che si può una gamba davanti all'altra essere come quella bambina di Teresin che chi andrà a Praga o c'è già stato e ha visitato il museo dei bambini che a Teresin potevano fare le recite o colorare coi pastelli e che poi un giorno furono tutti deportati e uccisi ad Auschwitz per la colpa di essere nata, nati perché erano bambini quindi non potevano aver fatto del male a nessuno, c'è una bambina di cui non ricordo il nome che ha disegnato una farfalla gialla che vola sopra i fili spinati. Io non avevo le matite colorate e forse non avevo e non ho mai avuto la fantasia meravigliosa della bambina di Teresin che la farfalla gialla voli sempre sopra i fili spinati e questo è un semplicissimo messaggio da nonna che io vorrei lasciare ai miei futuri nipoti ideali che siano in grado di fare la scelta 
e con la loro responsabilità e la loro coscienza essere sempre quella farfalla gialla che vola sopra i fili spinati. Grazie. Thank you. We'll now move on to music. We would like to thank Anna Bardos, Shil Zadowski for being here with us today. And uh, will offer us uh, an example of Yiddish uh, music. Thank you. Thank you. 
Grazie. Buongiorno a tutti. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank all the colleagues here today, as well as those connected remotely, all the citizens and associations. I'd like to welcome Chief Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, President of the Confederation of European Rabbis, Jula Sharkozy from the Rome community, from the Roma community, rather, and the artists here today. Today we, we commemorate 76 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, which revealed to the world the horrors of the Nazi genocide. Despite the time that has passed, what uh, witnesses saw, some of them here with us today, was the terrible situation. What happened in that and many other concentration camps and all of the death camps spread out throughout Europe calls on us to be res responsible and to look after this memory and to keep alive this memory. As Primo Levi wrote, if it is impossible to understand, then it is necessary to know. Auschwitz reminds us every day the nefariousness that the human race can be capable of if we allow ourselves to be uh, captured by fanatism, hate, and violence. The same hate we see today in so many parts of the world, which is a risk for peace, c civilization, and coexistence. Because Auschwitz does not only represent the a, a piece of um, crazy ideology, and criminal ideology, but it's also a symbol of absolute evil and the complex 
annihilation system thought and structured by Nazi ideology. The goal of their persecutions was to create a society based on an extreme form of nationalism, a virus which we see often today uh, could come back and we can never say that we have quashed it for good. In the new order imagined by Nazis, there was no place for diversity, dialogue, for the acceptance of the other. They wanted a society without Jews, without political dissidents, without homosexuals, without uh, people with mental disabilities, without uh, prisoners of war, without Jehovah's Witnesses, without Roma, Sinti, or Slavs. But their focus was the hatred against Jews, and they created a proper annihilation system. The concentration camps and the gas chambers were the extreme consequence of this methodical process, which had as its goal to create a hierarchy of human races, at the bottom of which were the Jews. So it is our duty to remember so that what happened can never happen again. Because once again, this story shows us the darkest side of humanity, the complete loss of the most basic feeling, which is pity. Remembering the concentration camps is something that goes beyond human comprehension. We should remember and condemn this ideological seduction, and we should do it without many of the voices of, of the witnesses, those who, who lived through it. As the generations pass, we need to look back without the precious help of those who actually lived through the devastation and through the ferocious force of the Nazi evil. But we should remember that those who lived through that horror has left it up to us to look after this memory. The construction of Europe is not just an extraordinary political response to the horrors of Nazism. It's also one of the main drivers of the progress of integration between democratic countries. Our history shows us that it won't be nationalism that will protect us from new dangers because the sac sacred sacredness of borders and, and uh, looking for a pure and unique identity will only produce new enemies. Europe itself was born in openness and cooperation in the awareness of a common destiny. It was born out of great vision, a courageous idea that could only take its force from a tragedy so huge as that which happened during the Second World War and the, and the mad Nazi designs. This is why we all have the responsibility to look after the democracy and a free Europe. Because Europe is the only reality that could allow us to once again rediscover the vocation that led us to build a space of democracy in which the law is the reference point for the relations between our member states, between our institutions and citizens, and also tomorrow with the states that wish to join us. As you know, we're going through a time of great change. During these very difficult months, we have learned to make some order in our values and our understanding of our interdependence. This is why Europe is more useful than ever to today's world. And the changes going on offer us extraordinary opportunities, which you, we should know how to use to improve the quality of our lives, to correct the development of the economy and society, and, and to create some sense in social sustainability and, 
and looking after an environment to reduce our distances and our inequalities. This is the wonderful work that the European Parliament is carrying out. Today, more than ever, we need to work together to protect our cohesion, that is, the context in which entire generations have found peace and have known to create a model that for a long time favored well-being, rights, and growth, because solidarity and mutual comprehension mul are multipliers of well-being and of security. But all of this is only possible in, an, in a society that is alive, pluralistic, and based on principles of humanity, not one of separation. Rather, we need to be interconnected. The International Holocaust Memorial Day is calls on upon us to be vigilant and to be brave, to prevent uh, negationism and amnesia. We need to be aware of, of our history, able not only to speak of witnesses, but also to intervene whenever we see signs and symbols of absolute evil. So it's a day to remember, but also to honor the sacrifice of those who lost their lives and who fought for a better world by upholding the values of liberty and justice. Thank you. And now we'll, I'll give the floor to Rabbi, Chief Rabbi, uh, and the head of the Confederation of um, European Rabbis, Pinchas Goldschmidt, who has sent us this message. My friend, the President of the European Parliament, Mr. David Sassoli, members of Parliament, dear survivors, dear friends, thank you very much for inviting me to address the European Parliament. 77 years have passed since a cattle train brought Yaakov and Mariam Schwarz, my great-grandparents, from a little village near Nierechhaza in Hungary to Auschwitz-Birkenau. On a clear summer day in May, hungry and thirsty, scared and soiled from a three-day train ride, they were sent to the gas chambers and cremated. Dozens of members of my mother's family from Hungary, men, women, and children, were amongst the 400,000 Hungarian Jews who were murdered in Auschwitz. Less than one year later, on this date, the 27th of January, the Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated by the Red Army, but very few survivors were found. Almost all of the inmates have been killed through the gas chambers, disease, and death marches. All those who perished in the Holocaust, among them Yaakov and Mariam Schwarz, who were poor peddlers from Nirachaza, were put to death. Why? Because they were part of a minority which spoke a different language, celebrated different festivals, and dressed differently than the surrounding people. My grandfather survived because he was far away in Yeshiva while his family was rounded up and sent to the ghetto. As a Jew, I mourn for the six million victims of the Shoah at the fast of the 9th of Av, the national mourning day for all the martyrs of Israel's destruction from the Babylonian exile through the Crusades, the Inquisition, the pogroms of Bogdan Chelenitsky till the Shoah. However, Today, the 27th of January, I mourn as a European. I remember the atrocities and crimes against entire humanity, the millions of victims, and the endless suffering. On this day, we remember the righteous among the nations who risked their lives to save some of the persecuted. Most of the almost 10 million Jews in pre-Holocaust Europe did their best to integrate and even assimilate it into modern Europe, becoming its writers, philosophers, psychologists, doctors, industrialists, poets, artists, scientists, politicians, and actors. Their dream was to become part of modern Europe, which again reinvented itself after the Second Industrial Revolution. However, 
the dreams of Heinrich Heine, Sigmund Freud, Rosa Luxemburg, Moses Mendelssohn, Samson Raphael Hirsch, Amadeo Modigliani, and Albert Einstein, and millions of other Jews were shattered with the onslaught of Nazism and fascism. At the end of World War II, a large proportion of Holocaust survivors felt that there was no Jewish future in Europe. The majority emigrated to Palestine to be a part of the new state where Jews would always be welcome. Others emigrated to the Americas, with only a minority remaining in Europe, holding on to the belief that they could rebuild the Jewish future. Millions of Jews were kept against their will in the Warsaw Pact countries, their communal, whatever was left of that, and private lives governed by Stalin's anti-Semitic totalitarianism. Today, many of Europe's remaining 1.6 million Jews are the descendants of Holocaust survivors whose decision to stay in Europe was an individual one based on personal circumstances. For Jews, the hope of a better future in Europe was anchored in the new structures and values being developed in Europe ensuring a future without wars, pogroms, hate, and anti-Semitism. What went on to become the EU was founded as an economic union with the central aim of ending the constant state of war and competition between the major powers. The European Union, according to former European Commission President Romano Prodi, <coughs> is an assembly of minorities which helped Europe's Jews to take part in this process, not as outsiders, but as fully-fledged citizens of Europe. This new Europe would guarantee a Jewish future by being based on the liberal democratic principles guaranteeing the physical safety and the freedom of faith for Jews. However, many Jews after the Shoah decided to live their Judaism privately and quietly, never trying again to occupy the public political sphere and trying not to stand out from the majority. Today, Europe is again at crossroads, testing its resilience and its values. The immigration of millions of Muslims from the Middle East is testing Europe again. The wave of Islamic fundamentalist terror and the uncontrolled waves of immigrants shook Europe to the core. New security measures and new enhanced cooperation between the security agencies of the member states had to be put into place in order to restore security to this continent. But as the anger against the new immigrants grew, a broadside counterattack against religious minorities formed the political landscape of the European Union. The question we should ask ourselves is, are we going to go the same way as Europe did almost one century ago, destroying the beautiful mosaic of European cultures? Or are we going to rise to the challenge, defend our liberties and values for all, demand security and adherence to our laws, while guaranteeing the cherished freedoms liberal democracies are built upon? We are witnessing with sadness that more and more countries are in the process of legislating new restrictions against the Jewish community of Europe curtailing the freedom of faith Jews have enjoyed in Europe for most of a millennia. One of the first laws enacted by Nazi Germany against the Jews on the 21st of April 1933 was the prohibition against kosher slaughter with the thought to make life as difficult as possible for Jews and get them to emigrate as fast as possible. The same law was enacted again last year in Wallonia and Flanders in Belgium, maybe not with the same intentions, but definitely with the same results. In Iceland, Scandinavia and Finland, citizens are pushing legislation to outlaw circumcision, proposing a six-year jail sentence for a Jewish parent who will circumcise their child. In Soviet Russia, the punishment was only five years for the same offense, recognizing, of course, that a Finnish jail is a five-star hotel compared to a Russian prison where Alexei Navalny is currently being held. We know that we are not the principal targets of these laws, but we are definitely the collateral victims. My friends, I would like to ask you, is this really what Europe wants? To emulate and copy militant secularist restrictions of the Soviet Union against religion? 
The European Union is currently in the process of suing and imposing sanctions against member states which deviated from the principles of liberal democracies by infringing on the independence of the judiciary and of the free press. However, let me be clear. States which restrict minority religious freedoms are not any better and are also deviating from the basic principles and values on which post-Holocaust Europe has been built on. After Charlie Hebdo and repeated attacks on synagogues, kosher supermarkets and schools, many European politicians have announced that Europe without Jews is not Europe, even appointing special envoys to support the Jewish future. But at the same time, these political leaders endorsed legislation restricting the freedom of Jewish religious practice. Let me say this today on the International Day of Holocaust and Remembrance here in the European Parliament in Brussels. These declarations are totally worthless and hypocritical. Legislation against religion in Europe has to stop. It is the only continent in the world where such initiatives are taking place. I am turning to you, my friend, Mr. Sassoli, President of the European Parliament. If Europe wants its remaining Jews to stay in Europe, enshrine the rights of minority religion to practice their faith the same way it was done in Germany and Austria, two countries in Europe where the numbers of Jews are actually growing. The COVID-19 virus is the biggest challenge humanity has faced since World War II. The virus killed millions, wrecked economies, and disrupted the lives of everyone. Grandparents cannot kiss their grandchildren. Houses of worship are empty. Hospitals are filled to capacity. And everyone sees in his neighbor or her neighbor a potential threat. Populism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism have again raised their heads, adding to the turbulence Europe is going through. Europe historically had the ability to reinvent itself and redefine itself times again and again. Today, in the midst of this terrible COVID-19 pandemic, the time has come to Europe to redefine itself and reinvent itself as the greatest union of states providing stability, security, freedom, prosperity, and peace. A new dialogue with Europe's new and old religions has to be initiated in order to maintain the core European values. Pope Benedict XVI, in his address to the German Bundestag in 2011, stated that Europe's heritage was based on three foundations, the Torah from Jerusalem, the philosophy from Athens, and the politics from Rome. Based on these values, we have to find a new way to ensure the success of the European experiment. The EU, under German presidency in December of last year, presented the declaration against anti-Semitism and guaranteeing a Jewish future. Of course. The physical safety of the Jewish community is of primary importance. So is the constant vigilance against attacks from Muslim fundamentalists and extreme right-wingers like a year and a half ago in Halle, Germany. Much of the anti-Semitism today comes through the platforms of the social media, and these have to be more regulated. The annual report of anti-Semitism of Tel Aviv University gave us some good news there was a 50% reduction of anti-Semitic tweets on Twitter, and no Jew was killed in an anti-Semitic attack in Europe last year. However, if the freedom of religion will not be guaranteed in Europe, the descendants of Yaakov and Mariam Schwarz, and so also the other 1.6 million Jews in Europe, will have great difficulty in making Europe their home and believing in a secure Jewish future. Thank you again for inviting me to address the European Parliament, and thank you very much for listening. Mm. Ringraziamo il rabbino Goldsmith per le sue parole. Thank you, Rabbi Goldsmith, for your uh, words. We've uh, made sure you, your connection was good. And uh, we are uh, pleased to see that the uh, uh, rabbi is uh, with us from Jerusalem. Mr. President, my friend, uh, Mr. Sassoli, thank you very much for inviting us and listening. It's a great honor to be invited by the European Parliament. And you, Mr. President, you are the successor of the first president of the elected parliament of Mrs. Simone Weil, who really created this connection between Auschwitz and the new Europe, which is rebuilt after the Holocaust, and the European Parliament. So this European Parliament really 
had a first president who went through the horrors of the Holocaust in Auschwitz. And uh, based on this, today, as her successor, um, you have the, the great um, possibility and uh, to, to build on what has been built during the last years, a new, free, and successful Europe. And I would like to bless you in the name of all the rabbis of Europe. We represent more than 700 communal rabbis that we will get through this pandemic as fast as possible, and we will be able to return to our normal lives. Thank you very much. Grazie. E grazie per le sue parole, per il suo incontro. Thank you very much for those words and for that encouragement. I'll now give the floor to Gula Sarkozy, who is a representative of the Roma community. He's connecting to us from Budapest. You have the floor, Mr. Sarkozy. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, uh, thank you so much for taking part in this day of commemoration. I was born in January 1962 in the 8th uh, district of Budapest. In that uh, part of Budapest, uh, Roma have always uh, traditionally lived. 17 years before I was born, Auschwitz was liberated on the 27th of January, and that is the day we are commemorating. Well, 17 years before my birth, uh, these events took place. But if you think about how quickly our children grow up, 17 years is not a long time at all. When I was a child, I didn't really hear very much about the Holocaust. For the government in office at the time, they considered it was not particularly important for us to remember these events. When I was 20 years old, I watched a documentary film. In that film, I saw uh, Roma reporting their own experiences about uh, what happened to them in the death camps and their experience after their return home. 80% of these uh, Roma people were uh, illiterate, and as a result, they were unable to prove that they owned a piece of land or a house or any other kind of uh, property. So in the end, they settled next to rubbish dumps on the edge of forests or at the uh, edges of towns. In today's Europe, and you look at the people who are living in the most extreme poverty, then disproportionately we're talking about Roma people. We try to help these people and to try to give them better living conditions. And for the European Union, this is a major challenge. If we are succeed in this uh, challenge, you will need to put a lot of energy into the struggle. It's like planting a nut tree, and then you have to wait to see when this tree will bear fruit. When I was 20 years old and I watched this documentary film, I was overwhelmed by a feeling that I had to visit this place where these terrible events took place. In 2014, I took part in an initiative, uh, March for Life. At that time, I visit, uh, visited Auschwitz and Birkenau. This is where Mengele and his uh, henchmen tortured thousands of people. Barracks number 13 was the Roma barracks. The sign of the Roma is a, a black triangle. We brought with us 70 black roses and we lay them down there. There was a photo in those barracks of three small Roma children. Dr. Mengele had chopped off their genitals and filled them with manure. 
who wanted to find out how septicemia worked in the Roma race. From Auschwitz, we walked across to Birkenau. There we saw all of the horrors as we walked from one barracks to the next. In one of the barracks, I had a very strange feeling. I thought to myself, if I had been here, I would have wanted to die. But, of course, I can't just die because imagine if your children are in the next barracks. You would want to know how they were doing. Later, I was told that it was exactly that barracks uh, where these thoughts possessed me that the uh, Roma had been kept. We lit a candle of remembrance and we heard the music from Schindler's List with the very beautiful violin solo. And I st started crying there. When I went back to Hungary by train after this event, I thought about what I could do with the experience and the feelings that I had uh, felt. I had the idea of putting together a play about the uh, Roma Holocaust but because I felt too close to the events of the Roma Holocaust, I just couldn't do that all alone. A friend of mine uh, helped me to choreograph this piece, and children took part in the performance. These children were not from Roma families. In our ballet school, we put a lot of uh, value into uh, promoting talented children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, whether they are from Roma backgrounds or not. We try to help them. We try to help them to overcome the crises that they face and the negative experiences they've been through. In our school, we have a child who has now grown up and become an adult, he's now gone on to the University of uh, Dance and I w was told that about the, uh, her experiences, the going through very negative experiences. Rome are a part of Europe's history and we will always be a part of Europe's history. I can give you a personal example from my own family. My great-grandfather died in the First World War. He was a war hero. His name is inscribed on a marble plate in the church in Segesfeher. I can give you a second example. My mother's brother was uh, 21 years old and his uh, younger sister, aged 16, were murdered and that was in 1956. After their factory shift, they lined them up in front of the factory and shot them. Whatever happens in Europe in the future, I want to state clearly the Roma want to continue to live in Europe. We have always been part of Europe's history. We belong here and we want to stay. In conclusion, I'd just like to uh, read a Roma prayer that was written in the concentration camps. And I'd like particularly to uh, pray for those Roma who have recently lost their homes in a fire in Chicksomnio. I believe in the sun. I believe in love, even when I don't feel love. And I believe in God, even if God can't hear me. Thank you very much for your attention.
Grazie, grazie al signor. Thank you very much to Gula Sarkozy for those words. Now, before I conclude this ceremony with the recital of the Hendelke Rakant Min, I'd like to ask everyone to observe a minute's silence. Grazie. Adesso la parola al cantante. I'll now give to the floor to the uh, singer of the uh, Grand Synagogue of Europe in Brussels, Israel Müller. Thank you for being present with us today. I'd also like to thank the violinist Bogoslav Binask, who will accompany the closing uh, song. Oh, you saw 
Grazie, grazie a tutti. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who is connecting by video link and everyone who's here in the room. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to everyone who's made this ceremony possible. 76 years ago, the gates of Auschwitz were opened. 76 years later, Europe is very aware of the responsibility and its duty to remember.